Welcome to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's live streaming interview series, where leading new thought teachers, speakers, and authors share the intimate stories behind the 10 best spiritual books that inspired them the most on their spiritual journey. From well-known classics to hidden gems you might never have heard of, the No BS Spiritual Book Club saves you time and money by sharing reliable recommendations from those who've walked the path before you. The No BS Spiritual Book Club, the only No BS guide to the best spiritual books to inspire your own journey of self-discovery. Here's your host, founder of the No BS Spiritual Book Club, Sandy Sedgbeer. Hello and welcome. If you're looking for proof of life after death, or you want to know more about mediumship, afterlife communication, and what happens and where we go when we die, stay tuned. Because joining me today to share the 10 best spiritual books that influenced him the most on his life journey is mediumship investigator, author, and co-founder of the International Helping Parents Heal organization, Mark Ireland. And you can bet he's got more than a few books on the afterlife on his list. Mark Ireland, welcome. Thanks for having me, Sandy. I'm looking forward to our discussion today. So as the son of the famed psychic medium to the stars, Richard Ireland, death, dying and mediumship were a normal part of your life growing up. So, of course, we shouldn't be surprised that the 10 best books that had the biggest impact on your life journey, many of them do touch upon the afterlife and uh, what happens when we die. So tell us a little bit, just a little bit about what it was like growing up with a famous father who was giving all of this wonderful information to the stars of the day. Yeah, um, I would say there's like different facets of it. One was in the household where dad knew everything that was going on. So what you could get away with was kind of limited. Um, and that was harder on my older brother who got his efforts for having someone buy him beer when he was underage or drag racing, those things were thwarted. But um, in public venues, even my dad's own interdenominational church, I would see him demonstrate um, both psychic phenomena and mediumship to people. Uh, it was really phenomenal. I mean, the, the amount of information he would share that was either directional for someone's life and helpful. And you could just tell, I mean, he had, it was very specific. It wasn't general or anything and, and he was hitting the mark. And then he would bring through messages from people who had passed as well. Again, very specific in terms of the relationship between the person who had passed and the person who was receiving the message, maybe things they did together or, or what the person did for a living or anything that would identify him. And I would just see that <clears throat> and be touched by it. No, and that kind of gave me a confidence in knowing that we're more than just the body and a brain. And then, you know, on the celebrity end of things, he did, he was, um, he did have a lot of clients who were in celebrity circles. I think most of that was facilitated through initially his meeting with Mae West in 1952 through a Reverend Jack Kelly, who was her personal psychic at the time. And then after Kelly passed away, my dad ran into her again in Los Angeles one time while he was working there. And um, she reconnected with him and then he became her personal psychic. And then he was on a lot of TV shows um, including Merv Griffin and Dinah Shore, uh, Steve Allen show, which I have a clip from on my website. And, um, and then, um, people like Amanda Blake and David Jensen, Jansen went forward. Uh, I got to meet Mae West when I was 19, which was pretty interesting. Got to tour her apartment, which even though it, uh, it was 1978, it still looked like 1929. <laughs> oh, wow. How wonderful. Did your dad have lots of books on the subject? He did. And my uncle, too. He and my uncle were kind of two peas in a pod when it came to this whole field. And they were both very gifted. Um, but, yeah, there were a lot of books that that kind of trickled down to me uh, over the years, many of which I haven't read yet. I need to, but some of them go way back. But most of the ones on my list, all of the ones on my list are ones that I personally selected or were referred to me by someone that I trusted and thought, yeah, this is a this is a good one to read for what I'm interested in right now. Mm. Well, let's start with the first book on your list, and I'm sure these aren't necessarily in chronological order. But the first book on your list is *The Field: The Quest for the Secret Force of the Universe* by Lynn McTaggart, published in 2003. 
Yeah, so the timing of this book was pretty interesting because my youngest son, Brandon, had just passed in early 2004. Um, this book was so it was fairly new. Um, and I was looking, f I was really investigating the whole field of mediumship, psychic phenomena, and other forms of evidence for life after death. This one uh, was written by a journalist, Lynn McTaggart's a journalist, and I really like the approach. It was very readable for, you know, mainstream mm -hmm. audience, but it talked a lot about a cross section of all kinds of um, things in the science field that were going on that were kind of the cutting edge or what you might call <laughs> derogatorily fringe science, which I hate that term, but um, it was talking about findings in quantum physics. Um, it even touched on um, some of the psychic phenomena tests being done um, and including the research for mediumship that was done at the University of Arizona back at that time. So it really, uh, um, it, I, I was highly interested in this whole field at the time, not no pun, <laughs> but it, uh, it was one that appealed to me and I got a lot out of it. Mm. Book two is one that I've never heard of before. The yeah. Airmen oh, Who Would Not Die by John Fuller. 1979. So this, yeah. So um, this book is really hard to find. I had a hard time finding it. I found out about it through Tricia Robertson, who is was the president of the Scottish Society of Psychical Research. She's still involved in the organization, but they can only serve for so long, a few years or whatever. But she told me it was one of the best books she'd ever read that, you know, in terms of documenting uh, well case, good cases of mediumship. And this one, ironically, goes, it's about the medium Eileen Garrett, who is really prominent and well-known uh, as being one of the top ones in the world during the 20th century. And what had happened in this particular case, just to summarize it, was that this British airship that was kind of like the uh, Zeppelins that the, uh, that the Germans were using at the time of World War II, uh, but not exactly because they weren't as, they were dirigibles, they weren't, uh, I guess, as flammable necessarily as the, the German ones. One had crashed um, unbeknownst to people. And um, the only people aware of this at the time was the British military. And Eileen Garrett, during a trance mediumship session, brought through the captain of this vessel um, with a lot of detailed information that they had crashed and all this kind of technical stuff about the ship and the circumstances that no one would have any way of knowing. And it uh, later was all validated by the British Air Ministry. So it was really, it's a great read. And it really was highly, um, highly researched. Um, I'm, I become acquainted with Lisette Coley, who's the granddaughter of Eileen Garrett. And she talked to me really about how uh, that author had, had gone to their home and through all the archives of the, of, um, that were left behind from uh, Eileen Garrett. So it's really a great book, um, very compelling, hard to find. So the bit, the airmen who would not die, I mean, what do we know about how, why, et cetera? Um, well, I think that title just uh, speaks to the fact that um, <laughs> they that isn't that, you know, they, they went on and they yeah. were able to convey this information through to, I guess, show that they still existed um, through a, uh, a means that would have been not thought of by the British Air Ministry. And in fact, I think initially they were probably skeptical and thought, well, this woman's a spy, you know, how did she get this information? You know, But it, it was all cleared up and it's, it's highly, I think it's a great, uh, it documents this case very, very well. And it's, uh, it's really all around that case. Mm -hmm. Book number three is The Afterlife Experiments, Breakthrough Scientific Evidence of Life After Death by Gary Schwartz, who also was there, works at the um, Arizona, University of Arizona, does a lot of his uh, work there. Yeah, so that book, um, I can't remember how I found out about it. It was probably because, so my son passed January of 2004, and I was watching a news excerpt, and I may have talked about this when you had me on your other interview, but I was watching a news excerpt three weeks later about the studies they were doing at the University of Arizona. And I saw a medium named Allison Dubois before she became a big deal, um, go undergoing testing with sitters who couldn't see her. She couldn't see them and they couldn't co uh, 
correspond directly. And then they would debrief afterwards after she'd given a lot of information um, to find out it was highly accurate. So um, I thought to myself, wow, that's a cool process. I'd love to be in that lab. And it was like a year later, I actually got in there as a test sitter. But at this point in time, my son had just passed. I had just seen that. So I was aware of their study being done. And then with a book that kind of documented, um, it was actually around, I think, an HBO special that had been done in like 2002. And um, what they did was similarly tested all these mediums under controlled conditions, uh, asking them to direct their attention to a specific deceased person, then asking specific questions around that person who had passed, and then calculating, you know, percent accuracy and things like that. So it was really my first exposure to um, a scientific investigation of mediumship that was measuring how effective it was statistically. And um, so it was a very helpful book to me at the time um, with my son having just passed and wanting to know more about and kind of re-enter the field that my dad had been in. Um, and that's, you know, I, I think it's a great starting point for anyone who doesn't know anything about mediumship or knows minimal amount and is really looking for like, hey, is this stuff real or not? That book will give you some context with tests that were done with some top mediums under controlled conditions. Mm. You said it also uh, contributed to ideas for good protocols um, with your own medium certification program. That's true. Um, so it, it did give me some uh, ideas about how to go about that. After my first book, Soul Shift, came out, I was barraged with people asking me for recommendations on mediums. But at the time, I only knew maybe half a dozen. And most of them were well known and they uh, had long wait lists and some were more expensive than people wanted to pay. So I thought, you know, there must be some other folks with um, these abilities out there who are undiscovered. So um, that's when I put together this program and consulting um, the aforementioned Tricia Robertson, as well as uh, Dr. Emily Williams Kelly of the University of Virginia to kind of formulate my protocols. But in the back of my mind was what I'd read in this book and how those tests were conducted. And this is just something I did as a public service to help people direct them to vetted resources so they're not, you know, going to get scammed by somebody or go to somebody who thinks they're better than they are. But yet it was invaluable in terms of formulating that thinking about how I would go about that. Mm. Book number four, a very special place in your heart, um, Your Psychic Potential, A Guide to Psychic Development by your father, Richard Ireland, posthumously published in 2011. And there's a lovely story of how this book appeared in your life. Yeah, th this is pretty crazy. So I just mentioned about having watched that uh, excerpt on the news about the University of Arizona research being done and that the medium was Alison Dubois. Well, the very next day after I saw that, I got a call from a man named Jerry Concert, who was friends with my father. And he said, hey, Mark, I know what you've been through, and I, I know someone who might be able to help you. Her name's Allison Dubois, and here's a phone number you can call for an appointment. So I thought, okay, this is rather synchronistic. My dad's pulling some strings behind the scenes here. Uh, but even then, even though the show Medium hadn't come out on network television yet, she was still very popular because she's very good. So she had a, a long wait list. So I, I didn't get to see her till August that same year. Two weeks before seeing her, however, a man who knew my father handed me a box and I'm like, what's this? And he goes, open it up. I open it up and it's a manuscript. It's uh, all eight and a half by 11 typed pages it says your psychic potential, a guide to psychic development by Richard Ireland dated 1973. I'm like, where did you get this? He says, well, your dad gave it to me for safekeeping before he died because you were out of state at the time. I said, well, that was 12 years ago. Why are you giving this to me now? He goes, I don't know. I just feel like I'm supposed to. So two weeks later, I have the reading with Allison, and one of the first things she says to me is, so I, I think I have your father here. And he showed me a book, but I believe it's his book, but he's handing it to you to take forward. Do uh, you, you know what that means? I'm like, yeah, I think I know what that means. <laughs> so that's how I got the book. And then I was able to, within a reasonable number of years, get it published, and it's out now and available. Um, but I think, you know, growing up with a father like that, you see what he does, you experience it, but you don't really think about uh, what's it like for him? What's his experience? How did he develop that? How, do, how does one develop those abilities? So it gave me a lot more insight into that. And what I also found out was this book was actually put together 
um, through, he was doing workshops at the time in the late sixties, early seventies, teaching people how to work on developing their own psychic abilities. And so through the course of these workshops, he had somebody sit there that was like a ghostwriter writing down notes about everything my dad was teaching. So my dad's just basically verbally sharing everything and illustrating on boards and things. And then they were doing tests and experiments. And so it was all just kind of um, gathered together from the workshops that he had done. But I think um, it really expanded my understanding of what his experience was like and, and what really goes into it. If you want to, you know, take that to another level, or if you want to develop, whether it's at a basic level of intuition or all the way up to being, you know, a medium. Was, you know, was this hereditary? Uh, was your grandfather or any of your grandparents, were they psychic? Are you psychic? It is hereditary. Um, Dr. Julie Beichel, who runs Winbridge Research Institute and studies mediums, as others have figured out, it does run in family lines. So it must be genetic to some degree, or there's some other reason, whether it's socialized into you or whatever. But um, the farthest back I'm aware of is my father's grandmother read tea leaves. So she'd be my great grandmother on my dad's side. His mother was a trance medium. After he got into psychic phenomena and mediumship, she later got interested in it and then developed these abilities herself. And then um, my uncle, my father's brother, had it to a very high degree too. I'd say maybe 90% of my dad. And then even on my mom's side, um, my mother had a little, I'd say her two sisters had it more. Um, and I do have it to some degree. It's just been more kind of spontaneous with me and not really something I've worked on developing or tried to do it as a practice, you know, giving readings to people or whatever. I've done test readings for people just to kind of see where I'm at and see what works and if I have any ability and was pleasantly surprised. But it's not really been my calling, at least not to, to this point in time. Mm. Well, book number five must have the longest title of any book ever published. So bear with me while I go through the entire title. It's called Best Evidence, an investigative reporter's three-year quest to uncover the best scientific evidence for ESP, psychokinesis, mental healing, ghosts and poltergeists, dowsing mediums, NDEs, reincarnation and other impossible phenomena that refuse to disappear. And the investigative reporter is Michael Schmicker, and this was published in 2001. Are you seeing a theme develop here? <laughs> <laughs> so, I've actually had contact with Michael. He lives in Hawaii, so um, maybe I'll meet him face to face next time. I, I actually know a couple other people in the field uh, of this field of interest and authors who live there. So I'm going to be going there in March, so maybe I'll connect with him in person. But this was another one. I actually heard him on a podcast and then I bought the book to dig deeper. But again, kind of like the field, this covered a wide range of, of information. And I found some stories sufficiently compelling. I actually included them and footnoted him in, um, a couple of those in my latest book, The Persistence of the Soul. Um, one, I'm trying to remember the specifics of it, but it's, it involved a, a son whose father had died and then after the father had died, came to him in a way, conveying to him that he had, um, that he, the will had been modified, his will had been modified, and he should look in um, a jacket. So the, the person, the son, um, apparently had gone to find dad's jacket or whatever, and then sewn inside of it was a, uh, a small Bible, and inside that was an update to a will. So that's just one example. The, the, there's a lot more detail to it than that. And that really validates validates it. Um, so there's a lot of different stories like this. Some involve, you know, um, what that would be called an ADC or after death communication. Others would involve other types of phenomena, you know, near death experience phenomena and mediumship and so forth. But again, it was really interesting. It was a cross section of different types of stories and evidence um, that we go on after our body dies. Yeah. Yeah, and he certainly did an awful lot of research. He was reading 100, 140 books from the 1894 classic ghost study, Phantasms of the Living, to a fascinating 1999 study of near-death and out-of-body experiences in the blind. 
Yeah, he's a lot like the other gentleman I was mentioning, Michael Tim, who's who's re re read a great deal about all this research going way, way back and knows it in, in an encyclopedic way um, and has written a number of books. So, yeah, I give him credit for that. I, I don't have the time or patience for that, so I'm glad somebody's willing to do it. <laughs> okay, so book number six, We Don't Die, George Anderson's Conversations with the Other Side by Gerald Martin and Patricia Lermanovsky, 1988. So I bought this book because I had talked to two sets of parents who were kind of in the same boat as me. They'd had a child pass and they'd actually had a reading from George Anderson. The first one, um, we got to be really good friends with them, but they said it was almost like talking directly to their son. It was just beyond anything they'd ever experienced. So I was really impressed with that and curious. And then the other, the other one's kind of an interesting story. I was invited to go to uh, my wife and I were invited to a woman's house. She had had her son had passed not too long before that. And she had gone to George Anderson for a reading. And um, anyhow, she was highly complimentary. She says, I have a recording of it if you'd like to hear it later. I'm like, yeah, sure, that would be fine. So here's one of those instances where my kind of psychic thing comes through. She says, you know, the one thing that I, you know, I, I can accept that my son goes on and everything else. It's just so hard knowing I'm never going to see him again in this life. And for some reason, I just had this idea pop into my mind. And I said, well, don't think of it like it's, he's gone. Just think of it like he's far away, like he's in Australia or something. She said, that's exactly what George Anderson told me. Think, <laughs> think of it like he's in Australia. <laughs> so anyhow, that was interesting. But because of these accounts that I got from these parents, I thought, I want to read this book. And it was really interesting. It was, again, a journalistic approach from um, a radio personality who had had George Anderson on the show repeatedly. So it's a recounting of all these stories of caller. People would call in and then he would give them messages. Um, and, you know, apparently these were highly specific, phenomenal things. People were deeply touched. So it's it's a credible book. And it's just basically recounting, you know, this person's um, observation of these experiences over many years of this radio call-in show. Um, and it, for me, you know, reiterated that he is or was one of the very best mediums in the United States. I actually got to meet him a few years ago because he came to a conference that we hosted. So um, anyhow, that's uh, the summation of that book. So book number seven, The God Theory, Universes, Zero Point Fields and What's Behind It All by Bernard Haish, PhD, published in 2009. I'm actually watching a YouTube video of an interview with him right now. Um, he has a new book out. I haven't read that yet, but um, he yes. and his partner uh, or co-author were on and interviewed. I'm only about 10 minutes into it. But um, it was interesting because I read this book before speaking to a group in the Bay, San Francisco Bay Area um, at an organization called Foundation for Mind Being Research. And when I went there to talk, um, there was probably, I don't know, 60 to 100 people there. And near the front was Russell Targ and Bernard Haish in my audience. I'm like, gulp. <laughs> <laughs> so knowing this guy's a physicist and Russell Targ, you know, was involved in the Stanford Research Institute and all the remote viewing stuff. I'm like, I feel like, am I qualified for this? <laughs> but it went really well and they asked some good questions. But this particular book interested me because it kind of got into more the quantum realm, uh, quantum science, quantum physics area, which interests me because it's one of the areas in science that to me, we don't have exact explanations for how everything works yet. But to me, it poses some interesting questions that really made me think like, well, you know, that's one avenue you could take to maybe potentially get answers for how to link spirit and, and the physical world, how this stuff all works. Um, and two, two points in particular are the observer effect, which I don't know if you're aware of that, but it's basically been proven through repeated studies that mind effects matter. If you just boil it all down, mind effects matter and how it manifests. And the other, which is equally and maybe more intriguing to me, uh, is the... Um, feature called entanglement that's been oh, entanglement. Entanglement. and that essentially in kind of in a nutshell in a layman's terms uh, two particles that have ever come into contact in a special way can be separated apart as far as the opposite ends of the universe 
of whatever happens in one is still instantaneously affected in the other, reflected in the other, which now if you think about our phys known physical universe, if you were to traverse that at the speed of light, which is 186,000 miles per second, it would take 20 billion years. So those two things don't seem to jive. So what it tells me is that there's something beyond our realm, um, whether it's a oneness, another dimension or whatever it is, the zero point field, um, there's some way that those two things can communicate instantaneously. And, and somehow I think, you know, psychic phenomena, mediumship of these things are tied into that as well. Um, so this book kind of gets into some of those topics and more or less like, is there a creative force behind everything that was like the initial consciousness? You use the term God. Some people are turned off by that term, but you know, I think you could say source or whatever you want, but was there a consciousness, a primordial consciousness? And if so, how did things develop? And so that book gets into that kind of discussion. And then the scientific theory that could support something like that. It's not really creationism. I mean, I'm not a creationist, but uh, in terms of how it's viewed today, you know, through, uh, but, but rather I, I do think consciousness is primary and that consciousness has existed prior to physical reality. So um, yes. that's why that book interested me. I'm actually interviewing Bernard Heche and his partner, partner um, about his new book in a few weeks' time for our other show, What Is Going On, which you've been on. So I'm going to say hi and see if he remembers me talking at the uh, FMBR 10 years ago. <laughs> I will. I will. We're going to take a short break now. You're listening to a No BS Spiritual Book Club interview and sharing the 10 books that had the biggest influence on his life journey is mediumship investigator, author, and co-founder of the International Helping Parents Heal organization. We'll be back with more from Mark Ireland from his 10 best list and some revelations from his own books soul shift finding where the dead go and the persistence of the soul mediums spirit visitations and afterlife communication after this break om times tv maya angelou once said that there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you i'm sandy sedgbeer and when I'm not hosting Om Times Media's flagship radio show, What Is Going On, and the No BS Spiritual Book Club, I help people share their untold stories. Books are my life, my joy, and my passion. And there is no greater reward than helping aspiring writers get their books out of their heads and into the hands of those who are waiting to read them. If you feel that you have a book in you, but don't know where to begin, visit sedgbeer.com, click on the Work With Me tab, and find out how my experience helping others tell their stories might be just what you've been looking for. That's sedgbeer.com, S-E-D-G-B-E-E-R.com. Imagine becoming a super influencer. Reinvent yourself, invest in your brand, and then manifest your success with a robust spheric approach. Own Times Media and Broadcasting offers a unique and multifaceted way to become the spiritual and conscious influencer you deserve to be by putting your message across our powerful platform with its proven record of integrity and excellence. Through our produced shows, Own Times offers the opportunity to become a social media TV personality, a radio show host, an Own Times Magazine columnist, and a syndicated podcaster, all in one shot. By live streaming your show on Om Times TV and broadcasting it across the extensive Om Times radio and TV networks, you become more than a host. You become an ambassador and a force for positive change. Om Times, open yourself to the possibilities. There are 16 million children struggling with hunger in America. That's one in five daughters, sons, neighbors, and classmates who don't know where their next meal is coming from. Yet billions of pounds of good food go to waste every year. It's time we do something about it. Feeding America is a nationwide network of food banks that helps provide meals to millions of kids and families in need. Visit feedingamerica.org to help them feed even more. Together, we can solve hunger. Together, we're Feeding America. 
Welcome back. Mark Ireland, book number eight. It's the only fiction book on your list. The Da Vinci Code, Dan Brown, 2003. How did that slip in there? I think I just heard a lot about it from friends and everything. It was like this big wave of interest in this book because, and my friend had grown up Catholic. So I think it was kind of like a, a smack back in his mind to, you know, some of the, the things that he'd been brought up thinking and, and whatever. Uh, it challenged some of those things, but I was more interested in it. Um, I think what drew my interest was just this kind of alternative stream of Christianity that existed because my dad was a minister. He was a spiritualist minister. And then he actually branched off and became a non-denominational because even that was too dogmatic for him. He wanted free, you know, more freedom to go down a path that he believed in, but he often referenced scripture, especially new Testament verses, mainly the teachings of Jesus and talked about um, things like uh, the gifts of the spirit referenced by the apostle Paul in first Corinthians chapter 12 and things like that, that supported the abilities he had. And it just seemed like the churches had evolved from his perspective and really mine, it was kind of closed off to a lot of these things like, Oh, we don't do that. You know, that's in the past, you know, or yeah, there were miracles back then, but that's not happening anymore. Or like, Oh, someday after, you know, this, then that'll happen again. But my dad's like, no, that's always existed. Those abilities have always been there and they always will be. And so this alternative form of Christianity, which was squelched, you know, in the third or fourth centuries um, called Gnostic Christianity was uh, tied into Gnosticism, which is a different approach to the whole subject rather than focus on the idea of um, needing, um, let me see this, a blood sacrifice for salvation. It was more like the, the, sal the salvation, which I see as advancement or progression or refinement, is through the secret teachings that Jesus shared with his closest disciples. So it, it made, um, well, actually the next book gets into this deeper, <laughs> but um, that was kind of the, the thing that interested me that there's, there's this alternate Christian sect or way of looking at things that kind of no longer exists um, because it was pushed down because bureaucracy evolved and desire for control evolved. And so alternate perspectives weren't really tolerated. So I think that's what I got out of it. And then also learning about the Nag Hammadi library, which are all these Gnostic books that were uncovered in Egypt in I think 1945 by accident, somebody going through a cave, found these clay jars and brought them out and actually their mother burned some of them as, to, like, as kindling for a fire, so we don't even know what was wasted. But they found enough to find a, a number of these scriptures that were lost to history, really. So that was highly intriguing and interesting to me, too. Almost Indiana Jones kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, book number nine, as you said, is Gnostic Secrets of the Nassines, the initi Initiatory Teachings of the Last Supper by Mark Gaffney published in 2004. Yeah, so this book kind of took me to that next step, like, okay, I read this fictional account, but it had a lot of historical accurate data in it. Here's a book really focused on the history. And what it was talking about really was one Gnostic sect called the Nassines. And they apparently were probably the largest, it sounds like, of the time. And the most uh, that the church was most focused on getting rid of or, or squelching. So within this, um, the author shares that the documentation or the, the writings and the description of the Nicenes had been lost to history. However, there was a, um, a document called A Refutation of All Heresies that was written by the church leader at the time, I forget his name, uh, Bishop. But this refutation actually did a favor to preserving the history because he included quotes from it, and then I guess most of the entire main uh, content of um, of their teachings and their understanding and, and all, all about them. So that's what this book is really based on. It really dives into like the notion, like could Christianity have taken a different turn, you know, had this other um, idea about it won out as opposed to the more orthodox one that won, you know, and history is written by the winners, as we all know. Yeah. So um, it's it's too complex to dive into at length here, but it's an interesting book and it really gives you a different 
perspective on things. He also makes some assertions too, like he puts pieces together um, that you may agree with or may not agree with. But even just reading the content of what came from that group back in that time frame and their view of, you know, the the idea of your progression, your uh, getting beyond this world is something a little bit different than what mainstream Christianity teaches. Indeed, book number 10, The Sins of Scripture, Exposing the Bible's Text of Hate to Reveal the God of Love by Bishop John Shelby Spong, 2006. So this book I bought because I had seen Spong on, I had heard him on a radio show, and then I saw some YouTubes of him. And I was really intrigued because he was an Episcopal bishop, but he was very progressive in his thinking and was trying to get people to think rationally and not just accept every tenet they've been taught by their pastors or their church leaders. Um, and the reason, the main reason I was interested, it was because my father had to put up this with this kind of BS coming from fundamentalists his whole life. Like, that's bad. That's evil. Don't do that. You know, when, well, I'm sorry, it's a God given gift. You know, he was born that way. Um, and so I wanted to learn more about, you know, where are people coming from? Why are they saying this stuff is not good or that you shouldn't do it or whatever? And really, this book helped me a lot in terms of understanding, you know, how the, the Old Testament was formulated and the New Testament as well. And for people to take all of that literally is really a stretch because um, it, it developed 66 different books in the, in the um, Protestant Bible over a wide range of time and many different authors from different perspectives that were merged together by people, by men who decided what's going to go where. And to look at that all as like the word of God dropped on from heaven seems a stretch to me when you look back and for example, you know, disparaging comments about mediums primarily are found in uh, the Old Testament books of like Deuteronomy and Leviticus. But those same books will say, if you have a disobedient son, you should take him to a neighboring town to be stoned to death. Or, or adulterers should be stoned. Or if you've touched the skin of a pig, you need to be stoned to death. Um, crazy stuff. So if you just think about it, it's like, does that make any sense to you? Is that a loving God speaking to you? You know, so... I wanted more ammunition, I guess, to talk back to that group of people who were throwing rocks or stones at my father or this field in general, because I'm like, the whole, I think, spirituality came from people having spiritual experiences. Religion evolved from that. But then what got intertwined in it was humans' desire for control and to um, put things together they want them to be and to regulate people and their behavior and their thinking. So... That's why I read that book, and um, Spong was really kind of revolutionary. He kind of followed in the footsteps of, I'm trying to think of another bishop, Bishop Pike, back in the 60s. And Pike, his son, took his own life, and then Pike started having all these spiritual experiences, and he put out a book in 1968 called The Other Side, documenting all this. So he was also attacked by people saying, oh, that's the work of the devil. You've been fooled, and so forth. So he refuted that, and... Um, so I found Spong's work very helpful toward that end, and it, and it really helped me shape one of the chapters in my book, The Persistence of the Soul, that's focused on religion, history, and, and these phenomena, um, really to say, hey, you might want to take another look at this and just, just not accept what your pastors told you in a Reader's Digest version, because most of the people that say this have either heard this from somebody else or their pastor, or it's just been ignored and they don't know anything about it, and they never really read all of scripture they just know little blurbs that they've been taught of all the books all the 10 books um, that we've discussed here if somebody came to you and said look you know i'm really new to this but i do want to explore after death communication whatever mediumship which one of these books would you recommend for somebody starting out oh um probably the afterlife experiments um, yeah, it's, that's, that's a yeah. good one it's, it gives a, it's focused on mediumship it doesn't get into the other areas of evidence like near death experience but it's really well done um, it's very readable and it shows the process by which this research was done and the kind of evidence that was provided mm -hmm. well you know you're a mediumship investigator and you have this organization that kind of has a protocol to be able to vet 
um, and recommend uh, mediums. Has your father come through to you from any of these mediums that you've met or investigated? Um, quite often. <laughs> quite often. <laughs> yeah, all the time. Does it become a bit old hat now? Yeah, it, no, it's fine. I, I enjoy it. And my son, too. Um, uh, and that's really touching to me when my son touches in. Um, I'll give you an example. It was just probably a month and a half, two months ago. I was I was in the Phoenix area where you spend some time. Um, and I was visiting with uh, one medium that I know, uh, Michelle Claire, and another one I did know, Farrah Gibson. And I'd heard great things about Farrah. So we did, agreed to get together for dinner. So we're just sitting down having a pre-dinner drink and chatting. And then somehow I broke into talking about Brandon that he played bass guitar, the, the one you see in the middle of that blue one. Um, and then all of a sudden she goes, no, well, he's here. He said that his new one had an extra string. I'm like, oh yeah, that's true. Um, so this was his first bass. It's a four string bass, but his last birthday before he passed, which was in October and he passed in January, we got him a new bass and it was a five string bass. So that was kind of interesting. And then on the heels of that, uh, uh, she, she said, he's also showing me you like taking the strings off a guitar. Like, are you restringing a guitar? Well, just one day prior or two days prior, I had been in Prescott, Arizona, visiting another friend and she and I went on a hike and then we were walking around downtown and she took me into a music store and she asked the guy there, says, do you restring guitars? And he says, oh, yeah. And she goes, oh, I've got a Martin guitar that I bought. It's used. And I need to have it restrung. So I nudged her. I'm like, you don't need to have them do that. I'll, I play guitar. I'll do that for you. So we, I buy her a set of strings. We go back. I take all the strings off her guitar and restring it. So here's another thing that had just happened. So that's the kind of stuff I get all the time when I'm around these folks. <laughs> mm. In your book, Persistence of the Soul, you, you present detailed accounts and experiments conducted to obtain evidence. Um, you also did an experiment with your dying sister, didn't you? That's correct. So um, I had read about Harry Houdini and the Houdini Code. I read about this in a book um, by Alan Spraggett. I think it was called Arthur Ford, The Man Who Talks with the Dead or something like that. It's an older book. But it was really interesting. It was a good book. And um, in there, he talks about Harry Houdini before he died, sharing a secret code with his wife. Even though he spent a lot of his life trying to debunk mediums, he obviously had some interest in the possibility of an afterlife. So he left the secret code with his wife. And the code, as I recall, it was Roosevelt Believe. So he said to his wife, if anyone brings you this phrase after I'm gone, you'll know that I still exist. And so after he died, um, his wife, you know, put word out that she's seeking this code and a prominent American medium named Arthur Ford produces it. He gives her Roosevelt Believes and it made the New York Times, I think, within a day or two. It was a big deal. But then the skeptics came out of the woodwork, as you might expect, trying to debunk it in some way. Some claim that, oh, the two of you are in cahoots together. You're just trying to get media attention. So she told you what it was and you're acting like you got it. Or others said, oh, it's common. It's been common knowledge for a long time, even though no one else seemed to know it. Um, so I thought about that. And today, if you Google it, it'll say it's never been solved, but it actually has been solved. It's just that they didn't give Ford credit for it when he got it. So I thought, well, what could, how could you change that protocol so that um, you couldn't allege fraud or, e or even telepathy with a sitter? Because that was another allegation I think a man named Dunninger uh, said, well, you know, psychic phenomena does exist and telepathy exists, but there's no proof that you didn't read her mind to get that phrase. So I thought, OK, what if we took and I'll talk to my sister about it. I said, would you, you know, would you like to do something that could help with your legacy and help other people who might be suffering from the passing of a loved one to give them better, greater evidence that life goes on after death? She was all behind it. So I said, why don't we have you write a secret code or phrase on a piece of paper with no one around, you fold it, seal it, put it in an envelope and seal the envelope. And then you'd initial the outside. And that's exactly what we did. So uh, she did that about, I think two weeks before she passed, a week or two before. And then we waited at least a month before soliciting responses from mediums. And we did kind of a wide reach out to, and I had a, a partner help me with it. It was Dr. Don Watson, a neuroscientist 
that he had the credentials that I didn't have um, to help make sure that we were doing everything the best way possible. And then we did gar gather all these responses back and then we assessed them and put them together. And, and then um, eventually we opened up the envelope and revealed the content, which I'm not going to share right now because I'll kill the conclusion of that chapter for anyone who wants to read it. I will say that it was very interesting. I would portray it as positive. And I would also say we learned a lot. And I think that there's things that we learned that could be formulated into additional experiments of that type for anyone who'd want to conduct one. You know, there's a lot of people who never get messages, ever. Um, why do you think that is, that sometimes, you know, I mean, my own father-in-law gave me a phrase, and he said, if it's true, what you believe, he said, I'll come back and I'll say this. And it's a very unusual phrase. And, you know, I've been to a few mediums over the years. Never, ever, ever has anybody given me that phrase. Why do you think some, you know, spirits don't want to? I don't know that they don't want to. I think there's different reasons for that. And that's one of the things we learn with this too. I think uh, Linda Williamson, who's an English medium that I know, she's now retired, but she's very, very good. And she said, you know, um, when you're, a lot of people have tried this experiment and it's not always worked, but um, actually it worked for her once with John Edward because she read for him and gave him the secret phase that her, his mother left behind. Um, but she said, you have to consider the way mediums get information. Oftentimes it's a visual image of something. It might be a word or two, and they may not hear that auditorially. Even I've had my own experiences where I've gotten a word or two, but it came in as an idea or a thought, not as a word. So if it's complex and if it's hard to convey, you know, that way, it may be hard for that medium to reiterate because if your dad's trying to convey the message through imagery, could he do it? I mean, I don't know. You'd have to think about that. Could he do it through imagery? If you have somebody who's clairvoyant and they're relying on imagery in their mind to convey that to you, could that be conveyed that way? Or even if they get a word or two, is that going to be sufficient? I think the answer there is, you know, it's going to take an exceptional medium to do that kind of thing, a really high caliber one. And I know a few who might be able to do that if you wanted to try it. Um, I could talk to you offline about that. But I think that's the main thing. It's like Linda Williamson said, I think what you'd want is to give somebody something that would be easily recognized to them, whether that's a favorite place um, or some much loved home or whatever, but something that could be conveyed through visual imagery. Um, mm. I think so th that's one of the hurdles, I think. And then having somebody who's a high enough caliber medium to get that because as I've observed, there's a wide range in ability. Like this Farah mm -hmm. is exceptional. Gordon Smith in Scotland is exceptional. But I've met a lot of good mediums who are not at that level, too. Yeah. You, I mean, you were a businessman, and it was your son's loss that kind of pushed you in another direction. Um, do you ever wish that you'd followed your father's path before? Not really. I think I'm just a totally different personality than my father. You know, he was very live for the moment, have fun, live for today. I, I was very more conservative, cautious, pragmatic, practical. Um, so we were just different people. And um, so and I didn't want to be my dad. I, and even if I did, I didn't think I could be at his level because he was so phenomenal at what he did. Um, but I, like I said, I have had experiences and I I could see myself helping people that way at some point in time, you know, maybe when I step out of the business world. Um, but no, I never really had the desire to be him when I was younger. Now, maybe if I'd have been born with a degree of it, like he was, where it was just so automatic and so part of me, you know, such a big part of me, it might've been different. But even though I've had it and I know that I can do it in certain situations with, you know, pretty remarkable results, it's not like it's something that's just, it was who he is, you know what I'm saying? I can't say that that's who I am. That was who he was and who he is. So what would you say drives you? I mean, you are steeped in this arena now. You've written books. You know, you've started the Medium Certification pro Program. You help parents heal with your organization, helping parents heal. What is driving you? It's a number of things. I think, first off, Foremost is the desire to help people in grief who have been through something like I've been through so that they understand that life goes on 
so that they aren't suffering, thinking their, you know, their child was annihilated and doesn't exist anymore, but to recognize that their consciousness does go on. Um, it's also kind of to carry on my dad's legacy and give him credit because he's kind of been lost to history, even though I think his abilities were well beyond a lot of the people that had bigger names. It's, there's not a lot out there about him. Um, and I think it's an, it was an interest for me. It really became a passionate interest, the field to look back into from my own perspective after my son passed. Because um, I learned a lot from my dad, but it's not like I studied or read at, in depth about it. I wanted to know more at a deeper level. I wanted to experience it. I wanted to see how it works. And so I've been able to do all those things. And I've actually done it from a journalistic perspective, which I wouldn't otherwise be able to do if I said, okay, today I'm a psychic or a medium, you know, I can't really do that the same way. There's a lot of mediums that have written books out there. Um, they're, they're great, but I think mine have more credibility for the average reader because I'm an independent person reporting on something as opposed to saying, I did this, I did that. Here's what they told me, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about Helping Parents Heal. I mean, that is a much needed organization. That was uh, actually formed a number of years ago. I was, um, my first book, Soul Shift, had just come out recently. I was doing a talk, and during a break, a woman approached me, and this was in um, Scottsdale, Arizona. And she said, hey, I'm actually a medium, and I came here today to meet my, my, my like-minded people because I just moved here from Florida. And she says, it's rather interesting that I know your son died on a mountain. There's another woman I just read for whose son died on a mountain. And I said, well, why don't you give her a copy of the book? And here's my contact information in case she wants to reach out. Maybe that'll be helpful to her. So it was in a day or two later, I get a call from this woman, Elizabeth Boyson. And she says, um, Mark, I read your book in one sitting. I loved it. I want to meet you and your wife. So we met and she told me she'd started this organization on Facebook called Parents United in Loss. Her name was Elizabeth Boyson. And she said, you know, I never had an in-person meeting, but I'm going to have my very first meeting for people here in Scottsdale or Cave Creek um, next week or in two weeks. Would you be my first speaker? I'm saying, sure, I'll do that. So I did that. And then she started having regular meetings. I went sometimes and sometimes I didn't. So fast forward to about a year later, I, I'm leaving a corporate job. I talked to another one of my medium friends, Tina Powers in Tucson. And she says, Mark, you know, I think your real passion in life, your real mission is to help other parents who have been through the same thing as you. So maybe you can think about forming an organization to do that. So I got to thinking, well, Elizabeth's already got a blueprint, but you don't need to reinvent the wheel. But she doesn't have a website. She doesn't have a newsletter. And it's only one location. So I called her up and said, hey, would you be interested in blowing this thing out and maybe blueprinting what you do in your meetings and seeing if we could get other affiliate locations around, you know, other locations and um, also, I'll help you put together a website and a newsletter and maybe change the name to something like Helping Parents Heal. She goes, oh, I love that name. Let's do it. So we forged ahead. And here we are all these years later, um, more than a decade, and we have 26,000 members worldwide. We have 165 to 175 affiliate chapters. We have a, buy, um, a conference every other year. There's one this August. And it's going to have a thousand people. We have already registered 900, and uh, the registration was only opened about a week ago or a week or two ago. So I'd say that the thing that we really um, do is that's different from any other bereaved parents organization. We allow the open discussion of spiritual experiences and afterlife evidence, and that's a big missing piece from those others. And so I think that's really been the real reason for our rapid growth is because it really does help people heal. Mm -hmm. It does indeed. I've got a friend who who has you know joined that organisation and had enormous support from it. Enormous. Yes. Mm. So, have you got any more books in the pipeline? I do actually. Uh, so, the persistence of the soul just came out, but I'm working on another one. It's, it's it seems like it's taking a long time, but this one, at the direction of a literary agent in New York who uh, works with John Holland, she said, "I think your next book should be a book." about for what, what it was like for you growing up with the father you had. So that's the mission. <laughs> so I'm pulling together everything I can there. Although I've shared a lot of my content in the earlier books, there's still more. And then I'm also incorporating stories I've received from people from around the world who have written me over the last 15, 20 years with their accounts, many of which are just 
fascinating and really amazing. So I'm going to share those as well. Um, so that's what's in the pipeline. Wonderful. Well, let me know and uh, come back on um, what is going on. Great. I'll do that. Okay. Mark today. Ireland, thank you so much for adding your 10 best list of spiritual books to the No BS Spiritual Book Club's library of recommendations. We really appreciate your contribution. Sure. I hope people enjoy them. I'm sure they will. Soul Shifts and the Persistence of the Soul, Medium, Spirit, Visitations and Afterlife Communication published by Inner Traditions. For more information about Mark Ireland's books, events, his certified medium program and helping parents heal, visit his website at markirelandauthor.com. This show is available as a free downloadable podcast on the End Times website and on Spotify, iHeartRadio and all the major podcast platforms. So if you prefer listening to viewing, do go and download it. That's it for this week. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer. I'll be back at the same time next week with another 10 Best interview for the No BS, B, no BS Spiritual Book Club. Till then, it's goodbye from me and thank you again to Mark Ireland. Bye-bye.